Um, yeah, so welcome everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, my name is Naomi Clement. I'm a Make and Do member. Um, we're thrilled to have Sammy Sang here today with us um, as part of our Clay Week, uh, Clay Week events. Uh, Make and Do is partnered with Clay Week, which if you aren't familiar with Clay Week, it's sort of, it's an organi international organization now that um, celebrates all things clay and ceramics for um, this week. So this weekend is sort of the last bit of Clay Week. Um, normally, there would be virtual events, but a lot of in-person events as well. Obviously this year, because of COVID, everything's happening virtually, which is in many ways wonderful because we get to meet so many different people and chat with so many folks. Um, I just want to, uh, a couple of housekeeping things. We are recording today's session. Um, so if you don't want your face in, in that recording, because it will be posted later on uh, Make and Do's YouTube uh, site, then feel free to mute your video. Otherwise, we would love to see your faces. Um, and we've got the chat happening here. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the chat. Um, maybe I know Sammy's going to start by doing a, a presentation. Uh, might work to save questions for the end of her, her artist talk there. Um, or field them in the chat as well. It would be great. Uh, I think we're not going to be as we're going to be a nice sized group today, so um, we can also just unmute ourselves and ask questions too once Sammy's done her talk. Um, I would like to acknowledge that I'm coming today from uh, Stratford, Ontario, um, and I'd like to acknowledge that I'm living in the ancestral lands of the Anishinaabewaki, Attawandarok, and Mississauga First Nations peoples. As a settler, I'm grateful for the opportunity to meet here, and I thank all the generations of people who have taken care of this land for thousands of years before me. Um, so I'll introduce Sammy. I don't, I've actually, I met Sammy very briefly in person at Ensika once at the cup sale, uh, and I'd been following her uh, on Instagram, and she mentioned that she had, I should have grabbed the pot, um, she's, posted some photos of some pots that she had that she was in her backpack at Ensika and she was selling them. And I, I messaged her, I was like, oh my gosh, I've wanted your work forever. And we like met by chance at the cup sale. And so I, I bought her work then and have been a huge fan uh, of Sammy's work for, for a while now. Um, so that's when she was doing her BFA at Sheridan in Oakville, Ontario. Um, I was just immediately drawn to her work. She's got such an amazing ability to capture complex human gestures and emotions in a fluid and direct way. Um, Sammy moved from Hong Kong to Canada for uh, the specialized art program at H.P. Beale Secondary School in London, Ontario, which is actually where I went, where I first got introduced to ceramics. Oh, wow. Yeah, got that connection. Your teacher was, was Kim Davies, right? Yeah, Kim. So she was, she was um, a couple of years ahead of me at Beale and then a couple of years ahead of me at NASCA. So wow. um, yeah, we're connected in lots of different ways. And um, so Sammy got her BFA at Sheridan and is currently a MFA candidate at, at the New York State College of Ceramics at Alfred University in New York State. Um, so Sammy's gonna talk more about her work obviously, but we're just thrilled to have Sammy with us today. And she's gonna do a little demonstration as well, which is gonna be super exciting. So. Without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Sammy and I'm gonna spotlight her video so that um, it should hopefully be the main video that folks see. Okay, uh, let me see, let me share screen. So this was my studio this summer. Uh, I went back home to London uh, where my parents were and this is what I had set up. Um, it was just in the basement uh, next to the laundry machine. And I was able to make really tiny, like small scale sculptures um, and I made a lot of cups also. And I'll be showing mostly what I've been making um, after I came back the summer to Alfred and um, this is a piece I made with polymer clay. Um, I was able to explore with different materials because clay wasn't very accessible this summer 
Um, I also did a lot of paintings too, and I'll show later on. Um, so aside from the COVID situation we have going on, um, our school ceramic building is also under construction. So a lot of kilns are not available to us right now. Um, all we have is like three test kiln uh, when we first came back to school. Uh, and that, that was, that lasted maybe a month or so. And just a week ago, we were able to start firing um, bigger scale. So this is what I did to my cups and smaller scale sculptures. Um, I was firing a lot of cups I made during the summer and mostly using them as test tiles um, for my later on sculpture so I can uh, move on quickly for midterms. Uh, these two are one of the, or two, two of the functional base cups that I like. Um, and I've been trying out this slip. Uh, it's quite shiny. It's almost like a glaze um, and painting with a shiny slip and under glaze on top of the slip. Uh, and yeah, just like some test photos. This is my desk. Um, the piece in the middle with the two black eye, um, that was part of a huge uh, sculpture I made last year. Um, it was probably three times my body size. Um, that piece was made but never shown to anyone. Um, it was shown to one, one of my female professor, Megan Smythe, but um, I never showed it to Crit and hmm, just wasn't ready to talk about it yet. And when I came back, it was still under covered. It was uh, covered by a white cloth. And um, yeah, I came back and I used a hammer to break it apart. And I kept the piece that I felt that was more important to me. And the rest was just in the dumpster. Um, yeah, and this is a piece that I look at every day in front of me. Uh, this is a photo um, in March. We had our our last crit before uh, the school got closed down because of COVID. Um, my work changed a lot compared to what I was working on when I uh, when I first got to Alfred. Um, this was a transition year for me. Uh, my work was less refined and mostly just getting ideas out and learning how to work with insulation work. Um, I'm trying to lift up the work with the support of a previous piece. Um, how I usually work before, I, had, I have a sketch, I have a plan, and I would follow through my plan till the end, and that's my completed work. But I'm learning to re-see re to, re, to look at my work again and uh, learning that they're never complete and they're ongoing projects for me. So I think that allows me to really play with my work. Um, yeah, so I start playing with how they can work as a, as a group, as a team, and they become characters uh, of their own and <clears throat> interacting in new ways. Sorry. <clears throat> and <clears throat> now they live above my ceiling. Sorry, I need water. Um, <clears throat> yeah, they're above my studio now. Um, they're above eye level, so what is wrong with my throat? <laughs> Sorry. Mm. Take your time. There's no rush. Yeah. Well, I feel like these days we're all super, even more aware when we have to clear our throat or cough or anything. Anytime mm. I do that, I'm like, I'm not sick. Sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> um, no Must be getting nervous. Um, great. 
We're all good. <laughs> all good. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, they're above my ceiling and I have a, I have a really high ceiling. I just moved into the studio um, this semester. Um, so it's a little bigger now. Um, they're not work that I want to look at every day, uh, but sometimes I like to revisit them and it's good to have them around me. Uh, but I also like to cover my work a lot of times um, just because I don't want them staring at me when I'm working. Um, not because they're creepy, but uh, I just don't want to be reading them all the time. And um, it's good to have new, fresh mind once in a while. Uh, so this is a piece I made back in London. Uh, I did a lot of painting. This is actually just painted on a $3 dollar mug canvas because I wasn't able to get a lot of material. Um, I started painting on my clothes too because that's what I had. Um, and here I realized I always had this urge to do something like this with clay, but I wasn't able to because clay has a lot of difficulties. In my case, I feel like there's gravity and you know, um, just with color, I struggle a lot with colors too. Um, I'm just learning. I finally bought underglaze because um, I just didn't have, I, yeah, I didn't have underglaze for a long time. Uh, yeah, and I feel like painting just allowed me to have all these ideas out and it was great to see them on canvas in real life. Um, and this is on my sketchbook. And you see on the bottom there, I, I placed this sticker, sticker figure here. And that kind of made me think that I can add different material to the piece. And in a way, it's creating this new world. Um, it almost looked like it didn't belong there. Um, and another painting. I'm playing with scale a lot here. Um, there's big scale and small scale. And Naomi asked in one of the questions, like, what does scale mean to me? And I'm still, that's something I'm still thinking about a lot. Um, why are things, certain things bigger? And why do I build a hand bigger than me? Um, that's something that I'm still thinking about. And that's a question that lives in my studio. Um, some close-up of the painting. So you see here there's a, almost like a curtain fabric painted uh, to divide the room. And fabric is something that I'm introducing to my ceramic work a lot um, and have been since last year. Uh, another painting I did uh, when I came back from London, uh, put resin on top of the sheen. And resin is also a new, new material uh, I've been working with. Uh, this is my storage area. I have these shelves here, or um, wooden frame, that I plan on uh, maybe making slabs uh, to make bigger furnitures, maybe for my thesis show. It just, it lives in my studio right now. As an, as an idea, but it's not uh, permanent yet. And then I have some sketches here. Sometimes these ideas, they become they, they're made into ceramics or um, they don't, but I, I have a lot of ideas. I like to just sketch them, get it out, and um, eventually they'll become a piece. Uh, this is the piece I have in the back here. It's finished. I have more photos of the finished work later on. And halfway, I did cover this piece uh, while I was drying. Um, I have another piece here. And that's a piece of polymer clay that I had to sit on top of the bone dry piece. Um, that's 
the large pan that I made. And it's living downstairs now because it's too big for my studio. And sort of just cutting up paintings I've done a couple years ago and kind of relooking it and putting it upside down. And um, I also, yeah, that's also uh, some polymer clay project I've done this summer. Um, playing with colors. And these are all the fabric I got. I got a yard of all, all the colors uh, I plan on working on with them and uh, making them into maybe sculpture, like soft sculptures. So that's the finished piece. Um, can I zoom in? Oh, no. Um, on the right shoulder, there's a piece of polymer sculpture there. And then there's like a rainbow shape um, ceramic piece that's glued on with, um, mo I can't say this word, Mar motor, martyr, cement paste. Uh, yeah. Um, and I use resin a lot to get uh, the sheen because sometimes acrylic paint can look a little flat. And I like to have some, um, I mix some color in resin to get like a glazed look. Um, that's the front view. And then that's the outer piece. Um, yeah, there's a lot of play after the piece been fired. I feel like the kiln, the kiln does things that I don't like all the time. <laughs> and it's sort of giving, giving the kiln your trust, just like life. Uh, you're giving per that person or the kiln your trust and then it comes out different than your expectation and that's okay. And I'm kind of taking control again and um, using room temperature application like acrylic, resin, or polymer clay and turning this piece into something that I like. Um, the tongue there is uh, made with fabric. And the base is actually, this is not the original plan. The base changed, it was gonna be a table, but I have this base sitting in my studio and I decided that it fit the piece. And yeah, that's all the slide I have for now. I have more photos, um, but we can, we can see how this whole meeting goes. Awesome. Thanks, Annie. Thank you. It's so I'm I'm not someone who sketches at all. So I I always admire people who have have such a beautiful fluidity with your your line work in your drawing and painting. But that also translates so beautifully, I think, to the the clay work, um, okay. which is an amazing amazing skill. Thank you, Alice. Do you, with the paintings that you were doing um, in London this summer, I mean, obviously it sounds like those were because you didn't, that was sort of what you had access to, but do you see those having a, an, a, a role in your studio practice now, like, or how the work, those paintings might work side by side with the, the Yeah, sculpture? it did, because um, I think before, before this summer, I didn't know how to decorate my work in a way. Um, a lot of them didn't have colors and they, they almost look, I don't know if everyone can see this, but um, I would use like a wash of color for the cheeks. Um, and they're just black and white, you know. And, and then I came back and I started using more color and I did some testing and they have a little bit more of like oil painting look to them and then finish off with some um, more traditional like Chinese painting line quality. Um, I guess that's sort of how like my style uh, came along. It was just all the art lessons that I took when I was in Hong Kong. And yeah, I, I had like my whole life was, I had art classes every day even though school is a lot. Um, 
I remember back then, I guess like since four or five till I was 12. Um, we had school till three and then we have after school, which is tutoring school till we're released usually like 8 p.m. or 7 p.m. And then I'll go home and have dinner. And by 9 p.m. I'll be downstairs taking art lessons again. And that's like my choice because I really needed it. Um, but um, it wasn't, I didn't use art as like a expression back then. I think usually for beginners, they would teach students how to draw something realistic and teach students skill like drawing skill, but not to express themselves. So yeah, I didn't do that until I came to Canada. And yeah, my work became more about me, not, not copying this famous artist. Um, yeah. Were there strategies that, like, did you find that difficult at first? Yeah, it was so difficult. Uh, I almost felt exposed, even though just making a piece about my dog. Uh, yeah, it, as, it was actually uh, Miss Davy, Kim Davy, that tried to push me out of my comfort zone. And yeah. I feel like I was abandoning an abandoning important skill of mine. I feel like the realistic um, drawing was really important to me and having that skill. But all of a sudden, like, no, like, I'm changing into this cartoon, like, simple line quality. And I feel like I was saying bye to something that I learned my whole life. Yeah. Well, but I think that translates uh, I, I feel like it's so harder to do what you're doing in terms of saying so much with fewer lines and gestures, stuff like that. But I, I, so I, I, I feel like that skill is still there in your ability to, to um, abstract it. Yeah, I think that later on I realized, uh, no, like all the stuff that I learned in Hong Kong are still there. And I just need to find find my style yeah it's an I'm ongoing thinking. pursuit sorry that's usually an ongoing pursuit <laughs> yeah i'm gonna start decorating a little bit long so here i just have um the white slip uh it fires a little shiny um and i used to really like to have a base coat for the whole piece it's already glazed inside um because I don't want to glaze after the piece has been decorated. Uh, Sometimes I have like a drip on the outside and it's hard to clean. And this is already this. So I'll just quickly coat the whole piece. Did you have to change your clay body when you moved down to Alfred? Was that sort of um, a shift as well for the process part of your work? I didn't have to change it. Uh, I was still using what I was using at Sheridan. Uh, I have the recipe and I can mix it. But uh, Shauna Bailey, she was so nice. She shared me that recipe of Accio clay body. So I've been using that ever since. And it's actually quite similar to the stoneware I've been using. Um, it just, I feel like it holds better. I can build faster because of it. But yeah, it fires to like a yellow beige color. Um, and I think I'm going to try hand building with white clay soon to see how it works with my decorating. Because sometimes the color can be quite muted with uh, a darker base clay body. What about the color is um, important to you? Like your, your paintings are obviously very colorful. Uh, the colors, I actually, I actually really like reduction, like content reduction look, like the earthy muted colors. Uh, so right now I'm actually just really out of my comfort zone, like doing something bright like this. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure what I like more yet, but 
So I'm going out of frame a little bit. So here I'm just using this flat brush. Um, it's a little bigger than the other ones that I use. It lays down the product a little faster. And will the texture kind of show on that or does it flux a bit? Uh, both. It, it melts a little bit and it still shows. And I like to show my, uh, the record of the brush strokes. So maybe what I'll do is one of each style. I have two here. Um, one is with like the oil painting um, look. <laughs> the other one just like lighter with a wash. Great. Thing. I should pick a really different, like more difficult piece to decorate. This is what I have around. Uh, the tongue ones are like really difficult to get into. Get in, yeah. Had you, I think at one point you were talking that um, you'd apprenticed with a potter, is that correct? Or Yeah, Timothy Smith in Wyarton. Okay. So was he, that was like traditional sort of throwing and I'm not familiar with his work. Yeah, uh, production potter, uh, beautiful, elegant, simple uh, decoration. His form is really heavily designed, but they're simple and beautiful. Yeah. And so you worked, uh, did you throw for him or? Yeah, it was uh, a lot of throwing and maintaining the studio, um, mixing glazes everything like re learning how to reclaim is the whole you can write a book on how to reclaim really <laughs> it doesn't lose any play sorry that's a good skill to have <laughs> yeah he doesn't lose any clay we, we don't have running water in the studio so uh, we wash our hands and all our tools with the same bucket of water the whole month <laughs> uh, yeah and then all the clay that slick down, we would use that to make shot glasses. It's like no clay is being wasted. So I have the front of the face covered. Sometimes I like to do the back too, but if the the hair is going to be black anyway, I would not cover up the white slit. Uh, but sometimes if the cup is if this cup person is going to be bald, I would I would do the back too. I think I'm going to do some hair for this one. So I have the front covered. I have these. Um, I have these underglaze here and then some of the shiny slip, the same recipe of this, but I have some stain in there. Um, and with this step, I will use a brush like this. It's still really small. It gives me a lot of um, control and be more precise. It's round tip. Uh, it doesn't hold a lot of liquid, which is what I want, because the recipe I'm using it doesn't it doesn't glide easily. Maybe I should add some CNC, but my gum.
So you're mixing the underglaze with that slip that the Chinese slip that you've made? Yeah, uh, just some part can be shiny and some part can be dull. Cool. Do you find it hard to translate stuff from the smaller scale, like surface to, to your bigger scale stuff or uh, how do you feel with that transition? Yeah, they're different, I think, uh, because if, if I'm using the same brush uh, at the end, they do look different. Um, I do decorate them differently. I decorate my face cup differently than my sculptures. Um, the sculptures have more surface to paint on and I have like hidden message in them usually. Uh, you seem to have a lot of yeah, these layers of narrative and stuff in your work as well. Um, even each of these character cups seems to have quite a story behind that. Can you talk a little bit about um, some of these characters and and sort of what you're bringing to their stories that some of it maybe you keep you want to keep hidden, but some of you want to share? Uh, yeah, sorry, the question was that just about the narratives that are that are in in your work as well i mean you your art artist statement stuff talks a lot about fears and anxieties and and those kinds of narratives um i'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about that yeah i can't think of what i want to say <laughs> Sorry. i wrote things down the narrative um, I think in my work, like I, I do investigate um, like personal stories, and I do sometimes when I'm lucky, I can have this connection with other people, and they share their stories. But I think listening, listening to myself, and listening to what other people go through. Sometimes I think that reflects in my work. And I think as I'm growing, I realize I have more control over my life and what I want to share. And it's okay not to share everything in my work. When I first came to Alfred, I was my first midterm credit. I was challenged by many questions and I thought it was like my responsibility to answer all the questions. Um, and I think by doing so, it left me feeling really exposed. And I actually needed to see a therapist last year because there's so much of me came out to the surface and things that I didn't even realize happened to me. I learned last year that all these things happened to me and now I see it in my art and that could be kind of dangerous, I think. Um, yeah, I have like a lot of people help me through things and sometimes working with sculpture. Uh, I can't work and talk at the same time. <laughs> um, Yeah, just like learning that there are things that I don't need to go through alone and I have my work to listen to me. I have my work. I can, it's, it's a platform for me to talk and share, but sometimes it's not about sharing. Sometimes it's just about expressing. Um, and I have total control of what I want people to know. And I was working on how to um, 
create these like coding, um, how to be more abstract and not so obvious of things I want to talk about. Um, is the creating the illusion or like this fog. John Gill likes to use this word for my work a lot. Uh, he always tell me to have this fog over my work. Um, all the information, all the message can be there and all the things I want to say can be there, but I can also hide them. So we also call it the underskirt experience. Um, it's there, but it's covered up or almost like um, when I'm ready, when my heart feels ready to show people, but very coy about it. Uh, he would call it like a peep show. Um, yeah, that's something I'm still working on and uh, finding my own comfort zone. Yeah, on things I want to talk about. Mm -hmm. That's right. I think it, uh, that sometimes, you know, as artists, there's stuff that's there in the work that's just there for us. And I think it's, that's okay. But I think sometimes we feel like it, we need to share exactly what everything is about. Like I, and for me, when I'm talking about my work, you know, there's sort of, it depends on the crowd. Like if it's a certain crowd, it's like, okay, this is, this is how, where I'm talking about it. And then if it's other people, then I, I go deeper. I'm like, well, this is also what's going on. Um, yeah. But it, and it, it's, a, that's okay. And you don't need to make any apologies about that ever, but it can be hard to sort of figure out what those lines are, I think, mm -hmm. and how to navigate yeah, I them. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. I feel like it almost doesn't matter what the piece means to me sometimes, um, why they were made and um, yeah, what, what it meant to me at the time, but like they already, the, the work is, they already served their purpose when they were made, being made by me. And as soon as they're out of my hands, they're serving another purpose for other people. Um, and they become someone else's story. And I think the same thing applies to my cups and my sculptures. That's will be, that, that will be like the most ideal way of um, putting things. Um, I do get like people asking like very specific questions about my work and why I made them and I usually give them like a really broad answer because uh, at the end like I want my work to be open to interpretations and yeah yeah well I think some artists maybe want like are doing it because they want the viewer to feel a certain way whereas some are doing it because they're trying to express something in them so yeah So I'm layering a lot of color um, and I have this uh, black slip if fire is really shiny. Oops. It's like this when it's fired. I like to mix with the white slip. I think up until last year, I didn't use a lot of colors and I finally understand why some artists say, oh, the reds are so hard to get, or, like the purple always burn off. Like I get all that now because <laughs> they are <laughs> and I'm still learning. Sometimes I feel like I spend time decorating a piece and at the end, some of the colors are gone. <laughs> yeah, I noticed you're using the Amico underglazes. Both Naomi and I work with Amico underglazes as well and I think for me and my sculptural work, that was a game changer was starting to use those because the vibrant reds that you could get with mm -hmm. the Amico underglaze and the yellows and the oranges and stuff 
um, that would stay through the firings even at cone six and stuff. And I've, I've even fired them to wood fire temperatures and had them stay. They're pretty versatile. It's pretty incredible. Yeah, it was a, it's a good investment. Mm -hmm. And then Sammy, if you do start getting into the Amicos more, um, it could be worth approaching them to see, you know, say, hey, I'm in grad school, I love using your products, um, I'm on a limited budget <laughs> anyway, um, you know, because you make your work is really compelling and they, they work with a lot of different artists, so it oh. never hurt to ask. Yeah, maybe I'll try. <laughs> yeah. They are also one of the sponsors of Clay Week, so. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I got all the primary color so I can mix my own. <laughs> yeah, and notice you're, you're mixing sort of as you go. Do you ever mix like big batches of a certain color together? I, I notice people do that. Um, I do that with my own recipe, but I haven't mixed for these other ways yet. Maybe mm -hmm. I'll do that, but I haven't found like a like a perfect shade yet. So maybe later on I'll do that. I do like to mix mix while I'm decorating. Just a reminder to everybody else who's in the room, feel free. I think we're a nice group size right now. If you just want to unmute yourself and ask questions, please feel free. Or if you're feeling shy about it, pop them into the chat and Naomi or I can ask for you, but feel free to ask whatever questions. I have a question. Hi. Hi. It's just a simple question. Do you uh, ever work on raw clay? You know, raw, do you ever do this on bone dry clay? Bone dry? I, when I was an undergrad, I only painted when they're letter hard. Um, I felt like because that, that was easier uh, for mistakes to happen. If I have, mis I can just like scrape it off or wipe it off. But yeah, I did. It was, there's no huge reason why I start decorating on bone dry. Okay, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> I'm curious who some of the artists are that you're looking at these days, Sammy, in terms of inspirationally, inspiration-wise. Uh, I have a few. <clears throat> I was trying to learn how to pronounce their name. There's one called Bruno Pon Pontaroli. Uh, he does like surrealistic uh, paintings um, of these like animals in nature and they're all like the torso is all like twisted and like really long or sometimes this really large animals like have this naked male squish in between. Um, it's How do you pronounce the last name? Uh, or spell it? Pontaroli. Uh, I think I got it. I just thought I'd share it in the. Oh, cool. Okay. P O N T I R O L I. Yeah, it's kind of scary to look at. I feel like once you start looking at it, but. It's kind of funny. Very cool. And I'm thinking about humor a lot. Or maybe I don't think about it, but it kind of shows up in my work, I think. What is it about humor that? I often think humor can lighten up a dark message. Uh, it's kind of like a easy, welcome for people to look at my work and the bright colors also helps too um, and then the dark and heavy stuff comes when you, you share a conversation with someone
I just realized, am I not really showing what I've been doing this whole time? <laughs> no, it's, it's good. Yeah. It's, it's interesting to see how you mix the colors too. So. You said you were thinking of um, trying more of a, a brighter white clay? Yeah, this is the uh, lighter clay body. Okay. Yeah. And I'm just working on my cups for now because they give me more information quickly than the sculptures do. Do you usually do this like decorate one at a time kind of thing or would you work on a couple at a time? I can only do one at a time because I don't remember what I put on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's hard with with the, those colors there. It's so different from your your finished result. That's what I like about the underglazes. It's it's a bit more. You can kind of tell a bit more what you've done. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's just how my brain works. I can't focus like earlier, I can't talk and <laughs> work at the same time. It's funny for me, I find there are certain, I can talk while I'm making, like constructing a piece, but talking while decorating, it, it's like using a whole different part of my brain. I can't, <laughs> I, I, which is hard because that's what everyone always wants to see me demonstrate. So. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, it's hard to think. Like yesterday, I, I have all these notes and I was just like typing and talking, typing, like going, going. <laughs> now I'm all blank. <laughs> Do you uh, listen to stuff in the studio like while you're making? Are you like a podcast listener? Or? I listen to crime stories sometimes. Uh -huh. uh, I don't recommend that because that can get really, <laughs> that can make your day really gloomy. Uh, I listen to music. Uh, if I want to just focus on my work. Oh, um, to ask sort of a, a different kind of question. Obviously, this is a very strange time. It must be a very strange time to be living far from yeah. home and in, a, and in the United States. Um, have there, you know, I imagine it's quite a different graduate school experience than you anticipated. Have there yeah. been any sort of like silver linings to that or? Being uh, able to go home early last year was, for me, it was a really good experience. Um, I needed to be out of the studio um, just to have like a refresh for my mind. Um, I need a break. Uh, First year was really hard. I never had such a difficult school experience. Um, I think I, I gave myself a lot of pressure being here. It's just a really good school. And yeah, I feel like I wasn't good enough. And uh, also working through some like personal trauma I had uh, because I was working on how to talk about my work. I think I went to a really sensitive place and that was really hard. Um, I started seeing therapy, like I mentioned before. That was my first time ever, and it really helped. But I also needed to just be away from the studio. So going back home in March was a really good thing to me. And yeah, I gave my head a reset, and then I felt good making again. Um, because actually in February, I wasn't able to make anything for a whole month. And that was really scary. Uh, I would make something and then I would have to trash it um, or I was afraid to make it. I don't know what was going to show up in front of me. Um, so I met with Linda Sakura and she's not my advisor at the time, uh, but I met with her and she gave me really good advice in like how to hide my message and still able to make. So she gave me ways to create again. And then I made this large piece, um, the one that I mentioned before that was covered the whole time. I made that piece and it was covered the whole time, but I was able to make again. And that kind of get me going again. Um, 
and then I was home because of COVID and I think because I didn't have clay with me I was able to try other materials and now I'm bringing that new new experience back to my studio and I don't think I would have able to gone there if gone to this point if that didn't happen so that's my silver lining I guess Uh, we have a question, Sammy, from uh, Diana. If you had any advice on approaching large-scale sculptural work when you're first getting started, like do you work with armatures or how do you go about building something larger? I probably should use more armatures to help me, uh, but I just I use I just do coil building, and I think knowing the moisture and the clay is important. I have a fan on uh, at the piece, like drying the piece as I'm working. Some people use a torch. Uh, I just don't like flames in the studio. Um, so I have this fan. I have two, like a small fan, the portable one and the bigger one that's constantly drying my piece. Um, yeah, I always make like a mock-up piece so you can see, because sometimes a, a sketch you can't, you can only see the front of it. and that was one of the comments that I got when I first came to Alfred was that all my pieces are front and torn. How about the other sides? Mm -hmm. So I think that's when I start making the kits and looking at a, a sketch in the, in the 3D way, more dimensional way. Um, building large scale, I don't know, I'm still learning. I haven't made a lot of large scale yet and they do fall like at least once every time I make one. <laughs> uh, they don't have, I try not to make something with flat bottoms, uh, just, just to push myself to another level. Um, I like to make a piece and then flip it upside down and then keep building from the other side so the bottom is not always flat. Uh, yeah, it can be challenging. I use a lot of supports like foam and heavier weight. Uh, to stand a piece up, but they always fall. <laughs> is your clay body must be fairly forgiving, is it? Or? Yeah, I think it's pretty forgiving. I add a lot of grog in there too. Uh, it can make the piece really heavy and the, the clay can get expensive, but uh, it helps the building a lot. Mm -hmm. I think this new way of painting allows me to make more mistakes because all the layering that I'm doing too. Uh, before, when I was only doing the black and white slip and the black lines, the mistakes are like more obvious and I can't really go back once I lay down the colors. But this one, I just keep layering and layering. It's more forgiving, I think. With the um, with the cups, um, do you see like are you really wanting people to use them as functional objects, or are you more seeing them as studies and maquettes for you, and and it's sort of a bonus that they're also functional? Or no, I want them to be like functional pieces for people at home. I think they're just maquettes right now because of the situation I'm in at school. We don't have a lot of kilns. Uh, and when we do have a test kiln, it, it's very limited. We have to sign up for test kiln and 
there's so many of us um and we don't get pest kilns all the time right uh, so yeah that's what's happening right now but sometimes if the peas don't work out um they're just a learning piece for me and unfortunately i can't sell it <laughs> but. With your sculptural works, do you think about where you ideally want them to live or? Um, people's home or backyard. I don't, there's no specific places I want them to be. Um, I think more important is who's getting them. Yeah. How so? I, I like to have like a conversation with the buyer if I have a chance. Um, and I have been so far. I haven't sold like a lot, but normally we would ha like share a conversation and that's more important to me. Um, it's such a unique opportunity to to have that intimacy, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. Are there certain ones that you have a harder time letting go of that like there are ones that you want to keep for yourself to keep learning from or? Yeah, there was. I have the photos. It's okay. And knowing that they went to good homes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that happens with cups too. Sometimes there's just a good face that I like to keep, but I can't keep all my stuff. Gotta sell them at one point. <laughs> Hi, Sammy, it's Carol and Bloomer again. Uh, question, I don't know how to form it exactly, but going back to the surface, um, do, doing what you're doing right now and using the underglazes, well, they're not, they're not paints, obviously, and it's sort of like you're covering up your work even as you're painting. So is there something about um, you're, you're inviting uh, unpredictability here? Is this something like a, you're, you're pushing yourself to accept unpredictability? Uh, yes, I am. I, yeah, I think with my work, I kind of compare it with life a lot. And my, I'm changing a lot as I'm growing. And I feel like I'm growing a lot because I'm in grad school right now. It's such an intense time. And um yeah being more susceptible to reality and things that happen to me i think that's a big part a big lesson for me right now um yeah i am learning how to accept and move on and all these things uh maybe just like becoming an adult uh, <laughs> I mean, your ability to handle materials is, is obvious, uh, you know, you, you've been doing it for so many years and it seems so natural, but at the same time, you're, you're, you're still pushing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think you're, before with my, my older style, I was very uptight. I was really picky with my lines. Uh, maybe it seemed like there's a lot of movement, but yeah. That was me being really uptight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We should all be so uptight. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I mentioned before that I always have a plan with my sketch and they're not as loose as the ones that I showed you. They're more like planned out. Um, and I would limit myself, I have three days to build this thing. And because I was in school, I felt like I had to follow the timeline I gave myself. And I think that's because I grew up in Hong Kong and there's so much, there's so much happening. And I need to be, I need to give myself a lot of rules to be successful or, or the person that I want to be. Um, yeah, almost like a, like a soldier. Well, not like that, but um, 
just a lot of rules I had to follow. I gave like, like even coming here to Alfred, sometimes teacher, you know, there is no rules and there's no right and wrong, but I often find myself asking questions like, is that okay to do? Like, is that all right? And then they will freak out and be like, no, Sammy, there's no rules. Just do what you want to do. And they had to keep repeating that to me many times for me to like really have it in my head. Like, oh, I can create my own rule. There's no, it's not the same school system anymore, like in Hong Kong. And whatever I create, they're going to be my own rule. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Sammy, as you mentioned, I'm, I have to jump off for, a, sadly, a prior engagement, so Carol's going to keep going. But I'm just going to ask one of the questions from the, um, from the chat here before I sign off. Um, and it's from Diana. She's asked, she's mentioned she has a similar confrontation with her inner world and her work um, and has a hard time saying not too much in her critiques. And she wondered if you could talk a little bit more about the fog aspect in your work and, and about not showing too much and sort of how you, how you navigate that and negotiate that. The fog accident. Okay, yeah, thank you, Naomi. Thank you for being here. Oh, thank you so much. And sorry, I have to, to pop off. Yeah. I wish I could uh, stay longer, but it's nice seeing you. such a delight watching your work evolve and grow. Thank you. Uh, actually, let me read the question. Yeah, I think it takes time to uh, talk about your work. Uh, I remember having this really intense critique last year. Uh, it was with a visiting artist, Gail. I forgot her full name. She was really intense. And I remember as soon as I said, my work is about my family, she looked at me and be like, girl, you're not gonna start crying, are you? I'm like, what? No. <laughs> no, I'm not gonna cry. But uh, I think that's sometimes, it's how I carry myself too. Maybe I, I wasn't confident and I didn't know how to talk about my work. And so that would be the first impression people would get. Um, I think you need to, first step is to accept that you don't need to share everything and you have full control on what you want to say and share. Um, and in terms of the fog effect, um, for me, the method that I'm using right now is having a lot of information on a piece and it's almost like who am I looking at? Or um, having the obvious, the, the things you want to say, and then things that you don't want to talk about, they can be really abstract. And they can only make sense to you. Yeah, that's what I'm doing for my work right now. Not sure if that helps. I think confidence as artists is something that we, I think we assume that we're going to get to that point at some point, but then our work keeps evolving over time and we're constantly searching out new questions to answer and all of that is what propels our practice forward and I don't know at 42 I'm still not there. Right, and I think it's it's definitely something to strive for, but I think it's it's when we are challenging ourselves so much in the studio and through our practice that um, it is sometimes hard to have confidence, but I mean, I think that's because we're pushing boundaries and I think that that's also a good thing as well. Yeah, I think right now, right now I feel like I'm in a good place, but that can be easily shaken up and my confidence can be gone, you know, when I'm working with new things. Uh, so right now I'm using this dry brush technique. Um, I'm not, I'm not taking a lot of moisture, but I want some like vibrancy to the cheeks. So I'm just taking the pigment and like dry brushing. And I'm still using the same brush this whole time. I think when I'm painting, one thing that's really important is knowing how much uh, product you have on your brush. Even when you're, um, doing the lines, that really affects of how the line comes out.
Like, I don't want that. <laughs> I feel like in my studio, I have a couple brushes that are those perfect brushes. And then you get so worried about the day that those brushes are gonna lose all their bristles and, and whatnot. And then you have to start, it's like a new brush changes the whole visual language of your work sometimes too, right? Yeah, it does. Um, I didn't use this type of brush until this summer when I was doing the, the um, canvas painting. Uh, this is when I switched over to this sort of brush. Before that, I always used these like fat brush, uh, sharp tip kind of traditional brush. So it definitely changed my work and how, how it's looking. Um, I think I'm happy with the face for now. Um, so Sammy, we do have a couple people who sadly couldn't get in before and who are joined us just recently. So I just wanna welcome them. And again, apologize that there is some hiccups with technology and that you guys didn't get here early enough. Um, Sammy's just been doing a bit of a demo. She did show us some slides earlier, but feel free if you're, if you want to unmute yourself and ask Sammy some questions, please feel free to do that or feel free to put your questions in the chat and I can read them for Sammy as well. Hi, welcome new people. Uh, so right now I lay down the base color and I think I'm going to move on to the line. So this is the part I need to like focus. <laughs> I got this brush from Inseka, it's from uh, Jackson, um, Sambao Company, I think. Jackson Lee? Yeah, Jackson yep. Lee. I think they handmade these brush, right? He does, yeah. I once sat, of all things, in a old barn in Australia and watched him make brushes as a part yeah. of a workshop like 15 years ago. It's pretty magical, yeah. They're yeah. Cool brushes. So I, 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 I splurged and I got myself one. <laughs> and it's really nice. Um, it gives me like a lot of control with my lines. Uh, it has the fat belt, like slightly fatter belly that will hold the liquid longer. And then the tip, it, overall the brush is not, um, really long and flimsy it has strength to it and that's something that i look uh, look into when i'm finding the perfect brush uh, let me start with the eyes so kathleen who just joined us said hi sammy sorry i'm late to the demo adding to the information given point i always thought it was brave to withhold info at a crit um, but only if there was a lot of work instead of words Yeah, I think that's when I start becoming more brave. And I actually had to ask for allowance. Um, I had my advisor and I felt like I had to ask, like, is it okay to not share everything? And they told me that it's okay. But hopefully, like, Ideally, I don't have to ask for permission, but I'm still at that point where I feel like I need permission from like a higher faculty to tell me what I can do and cannot do. Um, yeah, now I'm at the point where I feel like I don't need to share everything. It's only things that I feel comfortable and uh, enough for a conversation to keep going. And I feel like when, when you don't share all your original thoughts it allows people to have their own story uh to insert to their piece and that gives the work a lot more purpose i think my brush is getting dry as we talk <laughs> Let me know if you guys can't see what I'm doing. I'm finding it amazing when you first started painting this. I mean, it was such, it was obviously like you'd seen it as a face and the tongue was sticking out, but there was no detail to it whatsoever. 
And you obviously really have a sense of these three-dimensional surfaces and what you're going to put on them, even when you're building them. It's quite incredible. Yeah, they're kind of, uh, I, I don't have a pre-plan, like how the face is going to look like. Um, just kind of working on it as I go um, and kind of have like an idea of what I want, but it's not certain. I just realized I didn't decorate, I didn't add paint to the tongue. You really can't multitask. Sometimes I like to add like a another glaze, um, or what I have from here. The tongue can be like another place for like glaze. <clears throat> I think for this piece, I'll just let. Kathleen wants to know where your cat is today. My cat? She's in the apartment waiting for me. I think I'll take another half day break today <laughs> and go home early. Does she come to the studio with you as well? No, no, she's too young and <clears throat> it's too dangerous, I think, for her. <laughs> uh, I love to see her more often. I miss her all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I just got her uh, last month. Like very recently. Um, she's still really young. It's really incredible how much personality that face has already. It's so mm -hmm. cool. Yeah. Your mastery of line quality is incredible. Thank you. Kathleen is wondering, is the tongue handle something you thought of and it worked right away or did you have the idea and needed time to get it working as a handle? I think it worked right away, but uh, I need to figure out <laughs> the, the space here uh, and what what's more comfortable for the user, like how the weight is. Oh. Um, yeah, it doesn't, it's not normally attached here. This one came a little closer uh yeah this one did too a little closer but they're not really attached they're just attached in the mouth uh i think they still need a lot of testing and how much space i want here because it fits my finger but i have small hands yeah i need more feedback from people like user feedback uh, I do find that with these tongue cups, I have to slow down a lot more and my hands can be, can't be exactly where I wish to be because it's in the way. I pick like 
I'm going to need the worst case to demo today. One trick I like to do is when I feel like the face didn't turn out how I want to be, I put glasses on them. And that normally helps. <laughs> Hi, Sammy. It's Carolyn Bloomer again uh, with another strange question about, you know, um, functionality and usability. And I don't know how much it's discussed where you are now with your fellow graduate students, but with your really fairly monumental sculptural works, you know, if I can say that, that they are, they're made of clay, but they're, they really have a monumental quality, I think. And yet you, you obviously have a, a love or a concern or a view to clay as still having that vessel quality or you know you're using these cups as a sketchbook but but they're still cups and you're actually concerned with usability which is marvelous and so does that do you find that there's a push pull there for you or is it just totally all of a piece is it comfortable like how, how do you think about that uh actually <laughs> my cups are not talked about in crits or it's not very encouraged right now i think in grad school they the professor like need to make like focus on conceptual sculpture more than my cups uh these are just for me and for my own studio um I feel like I'm working with like really personal, like heavy things sometimes, sometimes in my work. And it allows me to have a break, like a mental break when I'm doing cups. Um, they're more of like a short read. Uh, in sculpture, I would describe them as longer read. Um, it takes more out of me. Um, for cups, these are a moment and they can mean a specific person to me, but to other people, they can be a fun, fun object. So, <clears throat> what was your question? <laughs> um, oh, it's just, does that preoccupy you or does it get under your skin or, you know, indeed, for, you know, it's always been a thing where um, maybe in academic institutions, you know, it's, it's that whole, um, is it important if it has a function? Is it a piece that has more or less importance if it's quote unquote functional, you know, and our, our cups, well, our, okay, so our cups looked down, do you feel like with disdain 
in in your environment right now? Um, I I do. I would like my cups to be functional and used, um, but yeah, I I don't know. I don't think I haven't thought so much about that part. Um, I like them to be used. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. And then now I like to um, use the same brush and maybe add some shading. And it's important also to know the moisture, how much product you have. These works, the cups have been shown in some of the galleries in the States, like Charlie Cummings, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the ones. Yeah. Uh, and Clea Carr lately, uh, they have a few pieces uh, this, for this December. Is there anywhere else that people can get your work? Uh, I'm trying not to work on too much of selling right now. I, I do a lot of DM selling. Um, I don't have time to update my shop, but I get DMs and I sell there. Um, I actually need to get back to people maybe in a few days. Um, yeah, I'm trying not to make too much cups right now. There's no time. <laughs> <laughs> Do you find with social media that people, um, I mean, I think it's been a shift for a lot of artists where yeah, now suddenly people are shopping and wanting to buy things that aren't even finished yet. And, and not finished? Yeah, like I'll sometimes have stuff like, you know, somebody could be in this workshop and be like, can I have that cup when it's done? Um, and sometimes you sh when you show process photos or videos and stuff through social media, sometimes people are actually, they want the work so much that they'll try and nab it before it's even done and it sort of puts a different pace for artists um, that we don't always get the, that time to sort of digest our own work when it's coming out of the kiln and I think that that's that's also an important thing too we have to decide like what pieces we want to keep and what pieces we can let go which pieces we still need you know to spend some time with to learn from um, yeah when you're getting direct messages DMs all the time it sort of changes the pace of things yeah, I mean, that, that part doesn't bother me that much. I think what bothers me is uh, I worry when the, the piece is finished, maybe the interested buyer are not that interested anymore or won't be that interested anymore. And I think that adds to like the pressure of like how I'm going to finish the piece. Um, because when no one was interested, I, I would be making the piece to my liking. But then as soon as someone tells me they're interested, I feel like, shoot, like I need to like now I have this worry and pressure. Yeah, that's just something I need to work on though. Uh, it's not, maybe it's not a common concern. I think, yeah, I was always like a, or trying to be like a people pleaser and I'm trying not to be now. Uh, more like self-pleasing now. But. <laughs> Um, I think I like to add white.
What am I doing with time? We started at 10. No, oh, you're about an hour and a half in, so. Okay. Um, so, just, uh, um, And then I'm going to show like my old way of how it would decorate. So it'll be similar, similar to this, um, the lot quicker. <laughs> okay. Um, we'll start with the eyes, put some bright white underglaze. And then I'll do like washes of color. Make sure I like the cheeks like runny. So I'll have the cup like this. I'll start from maybe lighter shade and then darker. Now I think about shading, just black. And sometimes a good way to check what you have on your brush is to dab it on like a piece of sponge or towel. Am I out of frame? <laughs> I can do that later on too, after the lines are on. I think I'm gonna add lines now. This one looking really surprised. Mm -hmm. 
kind of want her tongue to be something else. So I'm going to do the other stick. I'm waiting for that to dry and I can add more color. Um, go back to the face right now. I'm really adding freckles. Okay. When I'm doing the line, I'm thinking about pressure and lifting. And that gives different line quality. I try not to go back and fix a line um, because sometimes it can be obvious. Now that the tongue is dry, I'm going to
still feel like I need something. Um, that's when I would add some like, just like lines. I'm going to get back into some dry brush. that is fabulous that was absolutely mesmerizing to watch i think we were all just like in quiet awe thank you i know i could watch that all day <laughs> i really like the painting part <laughs> what an incredibly different process from the from the other cups that you did for us but yet it also still so much a part of your style and the look that you're, yeah, I mean, it's incredible to see them side by side. Wow. Yeah, um, I can move on to handling. We have like 15 minutes. <laughs> we have 15 minutes, yeah. If anybody else has some questions that wants to jump in, please do so as well. Oh, one thing I want to add um, about uh, critiques. There, there was this piece, I have this piece here um it's quite large it's taller than me now it's a figure um and i wasn't ready to talk about it or show it so what i did was i unwrapped it in my studio i took photos parts of it parts that i'm ready to show people um i can show slides if that helps Let's see. So in my critique, I have, I set up the room with the pieces that I'm ready to talk about uh, and finish work. And I also have this projector and this is what I had. Um, it was only parts of the sculpture. And this is how I can have full control on what I want to show. And this is what I meant. Um, And then when, when I'm ready to show the full piece, that's when I will show it in real life. But for now, this is what I have. And, and are the bricks the just something to help hold it up or are they part of the piece as well? Oh, they're just there to hold it up. Uh, they're just on her feet right now. And it gets quite wobbly when I'm building the top. I'm working on the face now. I uh, also show them sketches. Um, these are just ideas. Yeah, is there any more questions? I um, 
now that I'm done decorating. I can do hand building too. Um, Kathleen is asking, how much of your critiques are about building strategies? What was the beginning of the question, sorry? How much of your critiques are about building strategies? Um, th Kathleen, do you mean about technical side of things or maybe? Yes, she says right, yeah. Uh, so it's like the balance between conceptual versus technical. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, yeah, a li little bit. Uh, I think John Gill talks about for Megan, Megan Smith, she's also a hand builder and she talks about my working more architectural and um, yeah, and using perspective uh, for shortening for some of the pieces. Um, building strategies, I guess it's, yeah, it's a big part of my critique now I think about it. Uh, they talk about like how uh, sometimes the faces are flat, like just like these cups, um, and that allows like the the painting to be more free. Um, the expressions are more um, yeah. I I'm trying to come up with an answer, but uh, I mean you can think more about it. Let me move my laptop to another table. Oh, maybe I can show my studio a little bit too. Uh, this is what I have this semester. Oh, there's all those beautiful fabrics you mentioned earlier. The what? Right. Fabrics you showed us earlier. I just saw them oh, like, yeah. by the stack of them. Nice. Yeah. Oh, those pinks. And these were the work. Um, yeah. Let's see. I'm going to grab my, my other screen quick. Kathleen wants to know if you've already told a good John Gill story. <laughs> uh, there's many. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, he's, he's like a big part of why I wanted to come to grad school right away. Um, I came to Alfred for a visit um, two years ago, winter. Uh, that was right before I was going to graduate from Sheridan and I was able to meet him that day. Uh, it was actually like a snowstorm day and the school was close, but I got to meet John anyway uh, and he gave me a tour and then yeah, his comments just made me feel really excited about what my work can possibly be and there's still so much I wanted to work on and that's why I came to grad school and I didn't think I was going to get in right away or ever, but I was so lucky. Um, I know there's a lot of like challenge this year, uh, not just from COVID, but like just con under construction and my studio could be three times the size, but I'm still really thankful. I think it works for me. Um, there's no reason to be angry or salty about the situation. I think just being the positive of, of this situation. Um, but yeah, but John, yeah, he, he's really fun to work with. I have John as my advisor this semester. Um, and last year I used to get like one or two comments, like big, big helpful comments, and that would get me moving for the rest of the semester. Uh, now I meet with him weekly. 
and uh, he's really interesting and really brilliant. Uh, I feel like I don't have to talk about my work sometimes, and he gets he gets my work. Um, but eventually, I did I did share my stories when I felt like I was comfortable. Uh, he was kind of guessing and being really cautious about what he says about my work, uh, which is really good. And I think the first step is him being really understanding and careful. And then I notice that he's being really careful and I give him consent to ask more. And that's like the proper steps in approaching students, I think. Uh, so I give him verbal consent that like, it's okay, like you can, you don't have to be so careful, like let's have this conversation. And then we were able to have like deeper conversation about my work. Uh, I felt good about it. I didn't feel exposed. Um, yeah. Anything weird from him? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Like he would stand really close to me and and almost touching me, and then look at me with wide eyes and dancing around my studio. Uh, he talks about like the fog though a lot, and asks me words in Chinese and what they mean. Because like a lot of Chinese words, they can mean something really beautiful. But as soon as I translate to English, it's not the same. It just sometimes things don't translate the same. Um, yeah. So I did these last night. I think what I'm trying to do is this piece right now. You squeeze it, it's a pimple and like people are coming out of it and then dropping into the jar. Um, very loose sketch, but that's the concept. Um, I can add more detail. And I'm trying to keep, like I'm still learning how to build bigger things and I'm keeping the bottom really thick. I feel like I'm holding the tool like I'm holding my brush a little bit. I don't want to make the meeting too long today. Um, it's almost two hours. What do you think, Carol? I'm not hearing anybody complain. So I'm personally look, enjoying watching you sculpt this foot. So um, maybe we can do that and then we can close up and. Okay. Uh, yeah, with the brush that yeah. you use, it's kind of stiff. Sorry, I, I cut you off there. Do you mind oh, repeating? Uh, what's the brush that you're talking about using that's, that's on the stiff side? Uh, here, let me grab one of my brush. I'm, I'm going to take off my earbox for a second. Or just what, what's it like? I, I'm having trouble finding, buying a brush that's stiffer. Uh, 
this one. It's small and kind of the rounded tip. Um, like there was a name of a brush maker? Oh, or, or? I don't know. I don't even know where I got these. Oh, okay, you just They're gather really them up and whatever works. Yeah, okay. yeah, I just see, like, I just work with them and yeah. see how I like them. Uh, yeah. But it's not pointy, so it gives you more area, like a little bit more area. It's not like a line that's creating. It's thicker. Yeah. Um, yeah, the longer it is, the the less control you have, I feel. And the flatter, the more area it covers. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thanks. The one brush that you, that Sammy mentioned earlier was one right. made by Jackson Lee. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, maybe that was the one you're asking about. Yeah. Yeah, and I put the link, Jackson Lee, um, the business name is Sambo Studio, and the website is www.claychinaart.com. I'm not sure if the brushes are actually available online or not. Um, I know that they also sell a lot of tissue transfers and, and that sort of thing. Oh, but yeah, know, yeah, every good. year he's at Enseca and, and has a lot of brushes and stuff there too, but you might be able to just contact him through there too for brushes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. I noticed, Dominique, the other day you came in on one of our Zooms and you were firing the kiln and today you're unpacking yeah. it. <laughs> oh yeah, I was firing it. As I, um, I don't, I, I just got internet back here and, and I have to still work. So it's kind of nice to put it on and, and do stuff. But yeah, it, it, the timing was like that and I, I can't stop unpacking it. You know, once it's ready, you have to, <laughs> like, I, <w> I would have woke up at seven in the dark anyway and unpacked it. So. <laughs> well, I hope it was a great firing. It was good enough. It was good enough. Are you going <laughs> to pop online later and show some pieces on Instagram or anything? Yeah, I, I put them on and I'm uh, working on, um, I'm just setting up a Etsy shop and it's so much time, I'm realizing, <laughs> to, uh, to put all, you know, to do it well is so slow. So yeah, this is um, Sam Irving's old kiln. Oh, lovely. Mm -hmm. um, North Van, and then I brought it up here. Nice. Yeah. Hard to care for the camera and so <laughs> Carol, do you have more meetings today? Um, actually, after this, all I get to do is just sit and watch a whole bunch of open studios, but I get to sit in the background after this, so oh, I see. This, is, this is my last, like, in front of a camera event for Clay Week, and yeah, I'm going to Thank actually... you for helping me today. <laughs> oh, it's a pleasure. It's been an amazing week, but I'm definitely, like, achy to get into my studio now, because I've sat in front of my computer all week, and I just want to... Yeah. It's been an incredibly inspiring week. Um, 
And yeah, I just want to get making and I sent my kids away last night. So I'm going to spend some time in the studio today listening to other other artists. And yeah, for anybody else, there's still so much going on today, tomorrow. And in fact, a lot of the Canadian open studios, um, some of them are bleeding into Monday as well, since we have a holiday long weekend. But the schedule is up on clayweek.org. Um, a lot of them are happening on Instagram Live and definitely lots more stuff to look forward to. And of course, this is an annual event. Clay Week happens every October. So um, artists should definitely consider um, submitting for next year. Uh, it's pretty much just an open call for anybody who wants to get involved and who wants to share stuff during Clay Week. Um, and it's international as well. So this year we did a really, through Make and Do uh, partnering, we did a really good push for Canadian content, but we're also pushing for content all around the world. It started, um, I'm gonna say five years ago, but I think I'm wrong. Um, but it started more as a national clay week in the US and quickly became much more than that. And so that's a lot of the mandate of the board of clay week is to really get international artists as well involved. And so we did have some international events this week and we had participants coming in from all over the world too. So um, it'll only get bigger and better every year. And I think this year, especially, it's been just really great during COVID times for people to connect online and and what have you, but it's sort of like an Enseco where there's too much going on that you can't get to all of it, but a lot of them will be um, online after the fact and stuff as well too. I think all the Instagram lives that people are doing with their open studios, you should be able to go to their feed after the fact and watch them afterwards. So keep you busy for the next couple of weeks. So if this is not, am I echoing? Maybe a little. I can hear my own voice. Yeah. It's not too bad, but yeah, it definitely changed from before. Huh. Mm. Let's see. Is that better? Yeah, it wasn't horrible on our end of things. Well, it wasn't for me. I don't know if anybody else is having issues. Can you hear me? That's more echo. <laughs> Is that better? Yes. Okay. Uh, I can oh, hear no. Sorry, it's worse. I wonder what change. Anyway, I was just wondering if it's not on Zoom, like next year, if it's normal again, where would this Clay Week be happening? Well, Clay Week, the bulk of the week is actually online regardless. Um, mm -hmm. Just the open studio component that normally people would actually be going to people's studios and, and actually having live in person open studios. So, um, but I think next year we'll still encourage people to do it this way as well, because I think it's really opened it up to a lot um, bigger audience for people rather than just accessing their local communities. Um, and the open studio part grew out of the model uh, that Australia had started of an open studio program a few years back. Um, and I mean, it's always nice to go visit people in person, but you know, someone like me who lives in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, in the middle of nowhere, it's you know, you can't just drive and see a whole bunch of artists. So I think we'll definitely try and keep some online component as well. But the Monday through Thursday is always online um, every year. So that part will remain the same, but it will just grow and grow to the point where we can't see it all all at once. But it's like always good. The community has so much to offer and and all of the partnerships that Clay Week has taken on this year too have really helped to grow. This year, Clay Week partnered, well, we partnered with Make and Do Ceramics. We partnered with Art Access and Sika, the Color Network, Crafting the Future. Um, well, else, the Ceramic School, um, Matt Katz and his um, Ceramic Glaze course. I'm totally forgetting somebody. Quattro Books. Um, 
it's sad. I'm sure I've forgotten somebody. But yeah, it's been an amazing, it just grows bigger and bigger every year. Yeah. And you said this is the fifth year? I might be wrong on that. Don't quote me on that. <laughs> it's been a couple of years because I've, I've just joined the board this year. But um, I think it was three years ago or four years ago that I did work with um, Clay Week and we produced a book called The, the Crafted Dish. Um, so I feel like that was a good four years ago, maybe, but my yeah. sense of time gets skewed. My battery's running out. <laughs> <laughs> well, then we can't watch you all day. That's a shame. <laughs> How's everyone feel we end the meeting soon? I can keep working just with the camera on. So do you plan on coming back to Canada when you're done grad school? Yes. Yes. That's, that's the dream. Good. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. I want to try to apply to the Toronto Residency Hubber Fund. Oh, lovely. Yeah. I would love to, if I can. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't, I don't know, plans change lately. And I had other plans before, but now they're different yeah so yeah I think I want to live in Toronto but that can be really difficult mm -hmm. so maybe I'll look for some studios to rent you can always come out to the prairies and go to Medelta too. spend a year there Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll apply to any, like, all the places. Nice. I feel like my sculpting style changes every piece. <laughs> Sometimes they're, they're more cartoon, like simplified. And the piece next to me standing, it's more realistic. Do you go back and do a lot of work on the sculptural stuff at different stages or do you sort of get where you want to at this this sort of wetter stage or and some artists will go back and do a lot more carving at the leather hard or what have you do you how do you sort of feel like you get to the finished point of working what stage um i i work on them even when they're bone dry sometimes <laughs> uh it gives me a different effect uh like the piece i was showing you the standing one i i kind of like well not hammered but I made holes when it was bone dry, so it looks like it was, looks like the piece is more hollow and broken into. Um, I think different stage allows me to get different effects. Yeah. If I work on it, like if I open the holes during its leather hard, then it'll look like it's wet. It'll look more like flesh, but I didn't want it to look flesh. I want it to look more like a container it's harder container when it's being opened up. And are you adding water at all at this stage, like with a brush or anything? I have water here. It's dirty water. Um, I use that for like smoothing out details, uh, like wrinkles. But There's a lot back and forth at this stage with the feet. 
I feel like once I have the feet established, the building goes faster. <laughs> And will we get to see more paintings in exhibition or anything like that from you as well sometime soon? I like to. I haven't, I never really treated my painting as like a, like a piece. It's, I just started, I started painting last year mm -hmm. uh, and not like in my sketchbook. I like to show them. I haven't yet, but I include it to my crits now and yeah, they work together with my ceramic stuff. Yeah, they work really nicely together. Even exhibiting them together side by side would be interesting. Yeah. So we're coming up on about quarter after 10. Um, does anybody else have any more questions for Sammy? Thank you everyone for being here. My first demo. <laughs> this was your first demo? Yeah. No way. Well, I've done some in John Gill's class um, in part with students, mm -hmm. but really I was just working and no one was asking me questions. <laughs> <laughs> You were supposed to present this year as part of the new clay conference in Ottawa as well, weren't you? That sadly got canceled. Yeah, uh, it's got it, it's postponed. Uh, we're hoping next year in June. In June next year, okay. Well, look. Yeah, there'll be more more people then. <laughs> that was going to be my first. Now I have some tactics. Well, this has been absolutely wonderful, Sammy. I really appreciate how much time you've given us. It's incredibly generous. Um, and it's absolutely mesmerizing to watch you. Um, and we wish you all the best for grad school. We can't wait for you to come back to Canada. Um, and it's definitely, I really appreciate how much you share with us as well on Instagram. It's just following along with your I feel like I've been following along with your your work for years now and it's you're one of those artists that's incredibly generous with how much you share online and I and I really appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Carol. No problem. Well, maybe we'll end with that. You're getting some thank yous here. This was great. Thanks, Sammy. Fantastic. Thanks. Sammy speaks very eloquently and so thoughtfully. It's so fun wonderful watching you make your work. Thank you so much. I think we've all really, really appreciated this time. Um, but maybe we'll let you off the hook now. Well, thank you. I'll let you off the hook. <laughs> it's lunchtime for everyone. It is. Thank you, everybody, so much. And I hope you enjoyed the rest of Clay Week stuff that's happening this weekend. Um, and maybe you'll join us again next year. And then in the meantime, over the year, keep in touch with Make and Do and um, maybe we'll, we're going to start working on some webinars and stuff in the future as well through Make and Do. So keep an eye out for that. And if you join our newsletter, um, if you just go to the website makeanddo.ca, you can join our newsletter there and then you'll be the first to know about upcoming uh, workshops and demos or even just artist talks and stuff or live Instagrams that we're going to have because I think especially after this week, we've really seen how valuable that is to the community and we want to offer more of that and get more Canadian content out there. So um, keep in the loop with that by joining our newsletter. Awesome. Thank you, Thank you all so much. Everybody take care wherever you are in the world. Be safe. Thank you.